Hey, what's up, everybody? We have a new YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe right now. Leave a comment on the video. Share it with your friends. It's also a podcast. Three and out. Wherever you listen with me, John Middlecoff, Apple, Spotify, we have you covered. As well as thevolume.com. We have merch. Check out. I got three and out hats right now. Thevolume.com. Search the podcast. Buy some merch. Okay, part two of the action today. A lot going on around the National Football League. I mentioned earlier in the part one video of the early morning signings about the Packers and the two-headed monster that it was going to be Aaron Jones and Josh Jacobs. Well, it turns out they cut Aaron Jones, who is now available. And like a lot of people reporting, which is just common sense, He's going to have some options. Really good player. Doesn't change my opinion on the Packers. Still, they, Xavier McKinney, uh, the safety from uh, from the Giants. But I, I think the Packers, we'll still see how good their defense is going to be is the main question. But their offense, Jacob's a stud. I mean, I thought they had two top five running backs. Now they just got one. But l- love that signing. Uh, clearly, may, they wanted to go younger. Would have loved the two-headed monster, but have no uh, issue with them. Obviously, I'm very supportive and think it's a smart move to sign Josh Jacobs and love what they're doing and where they're headed. Okay, a couple of the big moves that happened in the last couple hours. Let's start with the big, big trade. Brian Burns from the Carolina Panthers for pick 39, which is the Giants' second-round pick, and the 2025 fifth-round pick. They get Brian Burns, and they give him a massive $150 million extension with uh, almost, I think, $90 million in, in guaranteed money. Now, texting around, just because I, how good is Brian Burns? And uh, got a lot of sentiment back from league employees, scouts that do this for a living. Really good. I mean, why didn't the Giants, or excuse me, why didn't the Panthers keep him? And, and I think before we get to the Giants, which... This is going to be the easiest trade that Joe Shane and honestly, the Giants have ever made. Wait, I give you pick 39 for a high-end pass rusher? The LA Rams offered two first-round picks for this player a couple years ago. Think about that. Say it out loud. Actually, I think it was last year. Two first-round picks. The Carolina Panthers, who were bought by David Tepper, one of the greatest, you know, stock financial masterminds this great country's ever seen has been a terrible fucking owner. Now, you could blame him for hiring the wrong people, but that's a disaster. To go from two first-round picks and saying no to then trading him for pick 39? Okay, the Rams were good. Those two picks still would have been in the 20s. I'll take pick 22 and 25 over pick 39 and a fifth rounder every day of the week. But I think this gets back to, obviously, if you could do a complete redo, they probably don't even make the trade for the number one pick. And if they did, they clearly would have taken C.J. Stroud. But I never understood it at the time, and it has aged so poorly since, that for whatever reason, they were uncomfortable with Brian Burns, giving him some massive extension. And they know him well. They've been in the building. Though, I have a hard time. Like, I don't view them like they know what they're doing. So this, I I don't act like this is the Ravens or Andy Reid or Shanahan and Lynch or someone that knows what's going on letting, you know, trading a good player. When you're going to draft a quarterback at number one overall and the offensive firepower you have in your organization is not great, to trade a wide receiver in DJ Moore who was under a cost-controlled contract, it it was crazy at the time, and it has aged worse. Because the Bears and Ryan Poles told them, listen, for this trade, instead of giving us one extra one, we want one of these three players. The defensive tackle, the defensive end, and the wide receiver. And their logic, as it was explained last year when the trade happened, was, well, harder to find ends and defensive tackles, wide receivers, easier to find, We'll trade you DJ Moore. So they took it. Clearly, they should have included Brian Burns in that deal and kept DJ Moore with Derrick Brown on their team. But mainly, if you're going to add Bryce Young to have a wide receiver, 
especially like DJ Moore, who is very versatile player. You could run just, I don't know, basic screens for the fucking guy to make it easy on your young quarterback. He can break tackles. It, regardless of even running down the field, he's obviously a really good player, but it, it was tailor made for a young player. Hell, he looked, he made Justin Fields look decent. So the, the Carolina Panthers should be ashamed of themselves. Just a complete embarrassment. It really is. And the Giants, who I, I was pretty hard on earlier today because they let a lot of good players go, uh, this was an easy move. And they clearly had the financial wherewithal. Other teams, you know, the, the bidding, clearly no one was offering a better pick than pick 39. And the Giants pounced. And they got themselves a really good defensive lineman to go with Kayvon Thibodeau, who I, I think it's fair to say people are going to, you get drafted really high. Time to time to show some stuff. Time to become a really good player. And it's easier to become a really good player when you have other players on your defensive line. So always a huge believer as a organizational philosophy, invest in the line of scrimmage, offensive and defensive lines. You can never go wrong. Clearly, the number one thing you have to get right in football is the quarterback. The Giants don't have that figured out. But this trade, adding more firepower off the edge, when you're pay playing the Eagles, who have a great offensive line and a ton of offensive firepower, the Cowboys, a lot of offensive firepower, in Washington, which I think it's fair to assume is going to be much improved over the next couple of years. Good move. Good move. A lot of money, but it's kind of the going rate. It's what these guys are get, making, right? 80 to $90 million. You're not going to get more than Chris Jones or Aaron Donald. You're not going to get Boso money, but that's a lot of coin, and you get an immediate impact player, which is always the goal. Because let's face it, a lot of these moves in free agency, it's fun. I, I love talking about it. But historically, you know, a lot of them don't always work out as well as the hype. And I was thinking about it today because I was texting with someone in the league about uh, the dude, the Ram sign, the offensive lineman. And we were talking Ryan Wendell, who my cousin played with at Fresno State. And when I went there to be a GA, he had just left as an undrafted free agent. He ended up making the Patriots. He started for one of their Super Bowl teams. I think the one they lost to the Giants and has become a really, really good offensive line coach and was an assistant offensive line coach forever under Dayball with the Buffalo Bills. And then Sean McVay hired him last year to be his offensive line coach. And I don't think it's any coincidence that their offensive line was dramatically improved last year. And position coaches with all these signings, obviously your head coach and your overall scheme from your coordinator matters to a player's success. But the position coach has such a huge impact on these players. If you watch the Kelsey retirement speech, him just, I mean, he cried as much for Jeff Stoutland, the offensive line coach, believing him in him than any other person. His wife, his family, his teammates. The, the position coach is just a game changer for you. And at the offensive and defensive lines, those there, there's a reason non-coordinators, those guys make the most. Jeff Stoutland... The Niners guy, Chris Kosorek, I mean, these guys are paid millions of dollars a year. They're not even coordinators. Because when you get good ones at those positions, they're worth every penny. And so a lot of these signings, I don't care what position you play, but specifically the defensive and offensive line, obviously the scheme and the position coach are, are, are just have a dramatic impact on your success or failure. This is not baseball, where you just trade or sign Freddie Freeman plug him in at first base, bat him third, it, it, he'll compete for MVPs. You know, sign Aaron Judge, put him in left field or right field, bat him third or fourth, you're fucking good. <laughs> That's not how football works. It's We've seen it for my entire life. I'm almost 40 years old. So many free agents, I mean, some of them are incredible. It's like, what a signing. And some of them, you're like, this doesn't work. Because scheme, ultra fit batters, and... Um, you know, we'll see. Do, do the Giants have, because they're getting a really talented player. Now, the culture there, losing Barkley, who's kind of been the face of the organization for a long time. Um, we'll see how this all plays out. They, they clearly, you know, put a premium on the defensive line, which as a franchise, they always have. The reason they won the two Super Bowls under Coughlin was because of the front. <laughs> and when you can dominate up front, you got a chance. You just do against anybody. The other big defensive signing was Leonard Floyd. Uh, I think he's 32, 31 years old. At one point in time, he was viewed as kind of a bust, 
right? A top 10 pick, a little bit of an underachiever with the Bears, but that's a good example. Scheme, position coach, just whatever. It didn't quite work. And then he resurrected his career in 2020 with the Rams. In the last four years, he's had 38 and a half sacks. So he has been an extremely productive player. Now, the 49ers basically gave him a one-year, $12.5 million contract. And he doesn't play the run. As someone in the league, I was texting, trying to get information on him. Like, he played half the snaps last year. So an older player, you can't depend on to play like he's Nick Bosa or Fred Warner. He's not going to be out there every snap. And he's not a great player against the run. But he has edge rush ability. And let's face it, you kind of get paid for sacks. You do. And rightfully so. If you can pressure the quarterback, that's that's how you get paid in the NFL. Now, I understand, quote-unquote, sacks can be a little pressure. Can you get to the quarterback? Can you just create havoc in the backfield? It doesn't always have to be sack. It doesn't even have to be a pressure. Create, Force him to move. Throw off the, uh, you know, the timing and the rhythm of the given play. So the 49ers, one thing they really lacked last year which they had had in previous years, is edge help for Bosa. They did not have another defensive end who was any good. Chase Young's one of the more overrated players I've ever seen. And part of that might be his injury. He's not the same guy. I know he's a really good player in college. Even early on before he hurt his knee, that, that guy's no longer there. He's a backup. I mean, as of recording this, he hasn't even been signed. And Hargrave is a lot like Floyd, is an incredible role player. Pass rushers. But the 49ers really struggled down the stretch of the season playing the run, and they're cutting Eric Armstead, who is a fantastic run defender. You lose him. Hargrave doesn't do it. Uh, Floyd doesn't do it. Bosa can't make every stop with the defensive line, so I I would imagine they're not quite done, definitely in the draft, but that's a good sign because they needed extra pass rush help on the edge which they really haven't had in several years. And part of that is because sometimes in free agency, the reason you have to make these moves is because you've missed in the draft. And because in their draft situation, once they traded for Trey Lance, they didn't have a first-round pick for a couple years. And I know they've had a million comp picks and a ton of third-round picks. Well, the last couple years, they've missed on them because they took Drake Jackson really hot, who I like, really talented player. Hasn't done anything the last two years. Hell, he didn't even play down the stretch of his second season. And I think at this point in time, you can't really rely or assume he's going to bring much to the table. So when you miss on a guy, you usually have to double down and pay another guy. It's why a lot of times, like, all these teams signing some of these offensive linemen, I bet if you look at their last couple drafts, the guards have gotten paid. And rightfully so. Forever, like the whole Bill Walsh thing back in the 80s was, we need good tackles. We need a good left tackle because it protects my quarterback blind side and he's playing Lawrence Taylor or Reggie White or just some of the best players in the NFL. And for a long time, the best players in the NFL were edge rushers on defense. Well, now a lot of those edge rushers go to the right side. That's why all these right tackles make a ton of money as well. Well, it feels like the last six or seven years, when I was in the NFL and like, Early on in the 2010s, there were a handful of guys that you would call high-end interior pass rushers. A handful. I swear to God, it feels like half the teams in the league have a high-end guy now who can line up over the center, line up over the guard, and get pressure. Some teams have multiple guys. So I think it's not random. Now, you're always going to get a little overpaid in free agency. You pay a premium. Uh, as the buyer and as a as a free agent player, if you're a solid starter, you, you get probably a 20%, 30% markup on your contract because you hit the open market. But these guards have gotten a lot of money. And in fairness, th- these GMs and coaches are going, well, I'm asking them to block Aaron Donald, Javon Hargrave, Fletcher Cox, retired. You know what I mean? Aaron Donald, go, go around the league. All these teams have good interior pass rushers. Or guys that can create half. You want to block Vita Vea all day? Godspeed. <laughs> I mean, ha- have fun. And I, I don't think it's random. Because forever, I've always believed you can find good guards and centers late in the draft. And it historically is true. 
But if you have a need and you have the cap space, I don't think it's that crazy because it's not just these guys coming off the edge anymore. These teams have good inside pass rushers. Uh, some other moves. I had a Colts fan was like, you're a fucking idiot. You don't think Michael Pittman should be franchised? Well, I don't think he's a franchise level player. It doesn't mean I don't think he's any good. When I close my eyes and think guys you would franchise, Chris Jones, Legarius Sneed, like those are franchise players. The defensive lineman from the Ravens, if Nick Bosa was a free, TJ Watt, that's what I think. Tyreek Hill, look at the contract the Colts gave him. Now, I understand the mechanism because you don't want him to hit free agency. And then anytime a guy hits free agency, there's no guarantee that you can get him back. But listen, Pittman's a solid player. To me, in a perfect world, he's like your number two wide receiver. And you're like, look at his production. Yeah. They gave him $46 million guaranteed. Elite wide receivers a couple years ago were getting 70 plus in Devontae and Tyreek. Hell, the second rounders a couple years ago, AJ Brown, Debo Samuel, and DK Metcalf, he's not on those guys' level. He didn't get paid close to it. Those guys all got 58 to $60 million two free agencies ago. So I, I, I'm not crushing them for franchising them because they used it to ultimately extend them, which it worked. But the contract shows you like, they don't view him as some like all-time great player. And it, it feels like I'm shitting on the guy. He's good. I'd want him on my team. I've liked Michael Pittman since he was in college. But sometimes you just have to do that. And sometimes you don't have the ability. Like the Dolphins. I, I, I haven't like dove into their cap situation. Clearly, they're all messed up. They, they really are. And to think that it hasn't happened yet, maybe it happens over the next week, signing Tua to a long-term extension, at a lot of money, anywhere forty plus million dollars to me feels insanity. But it, it clearly looks like he's going to get forty five, fifty million dollars a year, uh, which is crazy. Uh, another why? Uh, excuse me. Another quarterback. The the money's a little out of whack, right? Because forever, if you need a quote unquote bridge quarterback, that guy was like seven to ten million dollars. I guess not out of whack. It's just now inflated. It's now just more because the cap has gone up. Gardner Minshew got the modern-day bridge quarterback. He got $15 million guaranteed, which to me, Gardner Minshew, worst-case scenario, the Raiders don't control their own destiny when it comes to drafting a quarterback. They, they're they not drafting super high. They don't know who's going to be there if they're unable to trade up. So this is almost like a contingency plan. Ideally, we'd like to take a quarterback, but you never want to have to force it in the draft. And when you're not drafting in the top three or four spots, you just never know who's going to get picked above you. And you, you and GM say this all the time after the fact, like everyone wanted us to trade up. Well, I, I need someone to agree to a trade. So a lot of stuff is out of their control. I like the Minshew signing a lot because you can't go into another season with Aiden O'Connell as your starting quarterback. Not when you got Max Crosby in his prime, you got Devontae Adams in his prime, you signed Wilkins to a huge deal. Like you got some ready-made players ready to be playoff level guys. Now, Minshew got the Colts really, really close, but I I don't know if you can make the playoffs given that division with Minshew, but I, I, I do think it makes you a little more credible. I, I take you a little more seriously. I like that signing. I think the Chargers are about to kind of become the Ravens West. They signed Gus Edwards. Their GM, Joe Horowitz, is a Ravens guy. John and Jim are like the same guy. You are going to get a very, very similar operation. They are going to like the same players. And when you look at the draft, I'd be a little stunned if they don't take a lineman, <laughs> defensive or offensive. It's do you can you close your eyes and envision, even if, and we'll see what they end up doing with Bosa, with Mac, with Mike Williams, with Keenan Allen. Obviously, they got some high price, big name guys who are kind of in flux as of 4 o'clock Pacific Standard Time on Monday. They have a couple days worth of leeway with some roster bonuses on the two pass rushers. But they're going to get like old-school, hard-nosed players. This is not going to be, at least I'd be stunned, I have a hard time envisioning them taking a wide receiver in the top 10. Doesn't mean they won't, because some of these guys are really, really talented, but it just feels like they will take a different position. Uh, anything else? 
Oh, Eckler, Austin Eckler signed with Washington. I've always really, I, I've loved Austin Eckler. I think he's one of the best role players in the NFL. A lot like Tony Pollard. And I think there's a fine line when you get a guy like that who you, winning teams want. You want Austin Eckler or Tony Pollard on your squad. But you have to have the right role for him. Not every guy can be Christian McCaffrey or Alvin Kamara or Nick Chubb and kind of do it all for you. Those guys can excel in space. What always hindered the Chargers, though? Short yardage situation, they couldn't pound the ball. Why? That's not Eckler's thing. But you get him with Cliff Kingsbury. Think about some of his offenses in Arizona. Spread it out. Get the guy in space. Throw him wheel routes. Don't ask him to just hammer it home, running power 17 times a game. That's not He's not Ezekiel Elliott in 2019. That, that's not his skill set. So here's another key in free agency. You have to be on the same page as a GM with your head coach and his staff of what we want out of this player. I can't just sign Austin Eckler because he has a bunch of cor- a bunch of touchdowns the last four or five years. If not, everyone's on the same page on how to use the guy. And that's where I think the scheme fit. It makes a lot of sense. Just like Gus Edwards. Well, when did he excel? Well, he had Greg Roman before as his offensive coordinator. So they're going to know how to use the player. Sometimes you just sign players. And this, this happens less and less now without the understanding of what he does well. Why do you like Kirk Cousins with Atlanta? Well, because McVay and Shanahan, they both liked him because he fit their offense. And now they signed Zach Robinson coming from or to be their offensive coordinator with Raheem. It's like his skill set fits what they want to do. If you ask Kirk Cousins, now Andy would change his offense, but he wouldn't he like he couldn't just function as Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen in terms of running around. You can't expect a guy to do something he can't do. Just because you pay him a lot of money, whoever said player is, doesn't mean his skill set changes. Like if you're going to f- sign one of these guards to a lot of money, he better fit your offensive scheme. If he's a power guy and he struggles running some of the zone stuff, that's on you or vice versa. He's his own guy, and you're asking him to run some power stuff. He might struggle at it. When you when you marry the scheme and the talent to the player who's already established what he is, this is not a projection. The draft, like Jaden Daniels, Roma Dunze, whoever, all these star players in the draft, you're projecting what you want them to do in your offense in the NFL. There's no projection with all these guys in the NFL in free agency. They have years of tape. You know their strengths and their weaknesses. And a lot of guys, if they're truly hitting free agency, are going to have some weaknesses. That's why they're available. But clearly, if you're willing to pay them a lot, you view them having some strengths that fit you. You just got to use it right. And uh, this really has become a crazy time in the NFL. Today, Like I was going to go live. I still plan on it. On Wednesday. But I (laughs) forget. Free agency, we're going to have some trades, I would imagine, over the next 24 hours. But man, stuff just, maybe I underestimated it. Maybe I just forget because just a lot's going on. Uh, how, how crazy this opening tampering period is. I saw DJ, Daniel Jeremiah, tweeted something about how the NFL, you know, you get guys like uh, Gus Edwards is signing before some of these big name free agents in Major League Baseball who are still unsigned. Spring training's rocking and rolling. You just, the key to a successful operation, which the NFL is just in the peak of its powers right now, is to have just scheduled events that everyone knows what's coming. Now, I I, I thought it was coming in a couple days, but I knew Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, a lot of shit was going to happen. And then you know, in about a little over a month, the draft. Then you know OTAs. Then we take a little summer break and then training camp. It's very, you know, it's very specific what happens and when. And then because you're dealing with people and injuries, like all sign of random shit happens. But but it's not like a guessing game. Like the combine, the ball starts rolling into the day, and then the, the madness ensues. And because of the money flowing in from the TV deals, all these teams have the money. So any team, you you don't need to be the Giants or the Cowboys 
if you're the Jags, like low budget teams, low budget is the wrong way to put it. Small market teams have the capital to spend if they so choose. It's just based on how you would allocated it with your previous players. The Dolphins owner has a ton of money. Their problem is their cap's all fucked up. So they don't have the ability to do anything. What a day, man.